name is uh, Mikey Siegel. I'll be your moderator for the day, for the hour. And, um, and I want to, I guess, start by saying that it's a total pleasure to be here. Um, I've been a part of SAND, organizing talks at SAND, organizing panels at SAND for a number of years, and um, have the pleasure of bringing in some incredible folks, including today. And um, this is my first time over here in the Grand Hayes Ballroom, so I feel like I've graduated at some level. But I'm also at the end of the day, so I like, kind of graduated, you know, like halfway. <laughs> it's progress, and I'm honored. Um, so uh, Friday, I had the pleasure of hearing um, Bob Thurman give a talk. Was anyone at that talk on Friday? So it was great. He's really um, animated, and um, towards the end of the talk, he went into some... Um, critiques around technology, um, some uh, bringing into question some um, really scary stuff around AI and how we might upload our consciousness into machines. And there's a lot worth critiquing in technology. In a lot of ways, modern technology is not really designed to support well-being. Actually, um, in a lot of ways, it's designed to actually be distracting. And, um, and so we have this uh, technological landscape that we sort of feel a dissonance with, right? Um, but at the end of Bob's talk, he uh, made a plea, a call out to engineers. And he said, he, first he lamented, he said, no one is engineering the ability to lucidly dream. No one's engineering the ability to find the super subtle level of your soul or to find the place from which you can create yourself in any way you wish. And he ended by saying, I'd like to see engineers doing soul engineering. And in a way, that's the topic of our panel today. We're um, exploring the possibility of creating modern tools using virtual reality, wearables, AI, that are designed from a place of love to support love and awakening on the planet. And all the questions, concerns, and dangers that go along with that. And so in a way, you could say that um, if sand is about exploring the science of consciousness, this panel is exploring the application of that science, what you might call consciousness engineering or spiritual engineering or the evolution of the spiritual path. And so we're doing it in an unusual format. Um, I don't know about you, but um, I've been to many conferences and I've participated in many and sometimes the, the panel structure can get a little boring. And so we're doing something called the unpanel. Thank you. Um, and this is the structure of it. We are um, flipping the normal panel uh, relationship where the panelists are actually going to ask you questions. And you're going to take time as an audience in small groups to explore those questions. So first, we're going to go through panelist by panelist, and they're going to take three minutes to first give the context for a question, and then actually ask a question to you. And we're going to hear four different questions. And once we've heard the four questions, we're going to break up into groups of three. And we're going to have 10 minutes in those groups of three for you to pick your question and explore it together. You're going to condense that onto a note card. And then, popcorn style, anyone from a group can stand up share what they came out of with their 10-minute discussion, and then we'll discuss it as a group. And that's how an unpanel works. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. Um, so I want to begin with Federico. So you probably uh, are familiar with Federico. He's kind of a, a star of sand here. And uh, Federico is actually credited with being one of the fathers of the modern microprocessor along with uh, founder of some of the most important and pioneering tech uh, companies in the space. And 30 years ago, he had a mystical experience which turned his life inside out 
and he's been exploring the intersection of those worlds ever since, including currently um, the founder and running the Federico and Elvia Fagan Foundation, which is funding research on the study of consciousness. And so Federico, please take it away. All right. Here I am, here I am again. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah good. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, and I want to be very precise, so I'm going to read it. How can we know that a technology-induced mystical experience is authentic? So let me explain what I mean by the question. So first of all, the context is technology helping us have a true experience that reveals our true nature to ourselves. So not some entertainment or some create some funny states or whatever, but really get down to our true nature. So technology induced, I don't mean, you know, a special kind of pillow or, you know, a vibrating chair or something like that. I mean, specifically, I mean invasive techniques such as drugs, for example, or some form of brain stimulation that could be somewhat invasive, uh, because those are the ones that I would be worried about. Um, and uh, there are many other ways in which technology can help, but we have to be careful about uh, recognizing that many people use drugs in order to get to some kind of mystical or extraordinary experience of consciousness. And uh, that's the question is addressed to that type, uh, to that type of uh, uh, issue. So the other thing is that what is a mystical experience? Uh, a mystical experience is an experience where the perspective of a person changes from the ordinary perspective where I am an actor in the world, but I feel myself separate from the world. So I, I'm basically, you know, I basically, I have a sense of separation in my, in my relationship with others in the world to a unity of experience where I actually feel that I am the world, but I am also the observer of the world. So my, I am both the world and the observer of the world. So that experience changes completely the perspective that we have about ourselves as human beings. In other words, we are no longer, if I can be the world, I, I can obviously, I cannot be just my body. So that experience, that experience clearly tells us that we are much more than our physical body. So once you have that kind of experience, you can change dramatically in very short period of time. Now, how do you know that it is authentic? I know in my case that it was authentic because every part of me, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual part of me. In fact, that was the first time that I had a, what I would call a spiritual experience. So every part of me was resonating with that experience. And I knew that at that point that I was what I experienced. So thank you. Please go, go with that question and uh, happy hunting. And say the question one more time. The question, how can we know that a technology-induced mystical experience is authentic. Thank you. And at the end, we'll put all the questions up so you don't have to memorize them. Don't worry. Um, thank you, Federico. Two. So Carol, Carol Griggs is a um, PhD in professional coaching and human development. And she developed the iConscious human development model, which is a multidimensional model of the awakening path, including creating a system where you can actually evaluate yourself using an online system. And she's um, currently part of the founding team of a company called Leia, which is seeking to create an unconditionally loving artificial intelligence. Carol, take it away. Okay. So my question for you all, how do we move from tech-induced temporary state changes towards stage shifts? So I'm going to give you a little background with that. A state-induced um, technology tool could be a Think, one of the, it's a company called Think, a wearable on your head, it can be anything light-induced, sound-induced, a state experience could be a cup of coffee, 
give you an idea. It's, it's, it's a place you, go, you can come and go. So states come and go. And so a lot of the technologies that are currently out there are state-induced um, technologies. So they're looking for a state shift. And what I'm more interested in is how do we actually help solicit awakenings that are embodied and long-lasting, where it becomes more of your way of being and seeing in the world. It's how you perceive self, other, and world in a way that doesn't come and go. So my question, how do we move from tech-induced temporary state changes towards more stage shifts, embodied stage shifts of self, other, and world? Beautiful. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. And Mr. Vincent Horn. <laughs> hey, Vince. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Vince actually started his career um, working with Ken Wilber and then later went on to found um, Buddhist Geeks. How many people have heard of Buddhist Geeks? I'm a, I'm a Buddhist Geeks geek. Um, Buddhist Geeks was actually, um, it's, a, it's a podcast and media platform. They just did their 400th podcast. And it was actually um, a huge and important resource for me as I was beginning to explore this space. He really um, has been pioneering and creating conversation and media and content, exploring the intersection of technology and well-being. And he's currently a meditation teacher. Vincent would love to hear uh, what you got. Thank you. Yeah, good to be here. Um, can you hear me OK? Awesome. OK, so here's my question, and then I'll uh, break it down a little. So the question is, what might these technologies enhance and or make obsolete? What might these technologies enhance and or make obsolete? And when I say these technologies, um, I, I have kind of in my mind now a, a simple model or a simple distinction, which is right now there's a lot of um, in this broader space of technology and consciousness, you, you see different camps that are kind of part of the conversation. And you've got the psychedelic camp, and, and you've got the contemplatives, and you've got the scientists and the technologists, and you know, you've got the business people that smell opportunity to make money, and you've got you know, everyone. Um, and one of the most interesting intersections seems to be between the um, psychedelic camp, the meditation camp, uh, or the contemplative camp, and then the uh, technology side of things. And when I see the psychedelic and technology intersection happening, I, I see what I would call technodelics, um, you know, uh, drugs, computers that are like tech psychedelic drugs, or they produce similar kinds of effects. Uh, and then on the other side, where meditation and technology intersect, I see contemplative technologies, you know, uh, things that are helping to try to train, entrain certain states of consciousness or learn certain progressive or systematic instructions um, to move through different kind of training, uh, mind training, using technology, augmenting. Um, so if you imagine those different kinds of technologies um, and all the different things that could be created in, within those two categories, um, you know, what might some of those technologies, so with this question, you kind of have to imagine a technology, right, like a picture or something. What might these technologies enhance, um, and what might they make obsolete? Um, in the way that, in the same way that, you know, what did, what did Google Maps enhance? It enhanced our ability to get around and to, to know how to get places, so long as we have a phone and service. Um, but it also uh, made obsolete this sort of way that we used to orient ourselves in space. Thirty seconds. And so now, you know. We don't usually know where we're going if Google Maps can tell us how to get there. We don't, sometimes we don't even learn. Um, even if we do something over and over again, I've been amazed at that. So yeah, with these technologies, uh, might they do the same and how? Um, get imaginative on this one if you choose to take it on. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Yeah. OK, and finally, we have Kate Stockley. Um, Kate is a doctoral fellow at the Center for Mind and Culture and a PhD student at Boston University who's um, studying um, religion from a scientific perspective, so using neuroscience, cognitive science, and evolutionary biology. 
and along with her advisor, Wesley Wildman, she's writing a book called Spirit Tech, The Brave New World of Technology Assisted Spirituality. So you can imagine why she's sitting here on this, uh, on this <laughs> panel. So Kate, thank you. Great. So in my studies, I focus on neuroscience, cognitive science, and evolutionary biology, just like Mikey said, um, which is why I'm so interested in these things. But um, and interested in whether or not they can stimulate real, well, you'll decide that, um, religious and spiritual experiences. But I'm also really interested in looking at the ways in which science and technology are transforming religion and spirituality in the 21st century. So this kind of piggybacks off of Vincent's question about um, what makes, what may, will it enhance or make obsolete certain things, and I'm looking at religion. And so by religion, I mean humans sharing their spiritual impulses, practices, visions, fears, insights, and awakenings in groups. So in this distinction, which isn't perfect, of course, you can be spiritual alone, but you can't have a religion without a community. So throughout human existence, humans have never not had a religion. The Paleolithic and Neolithic were dominated by shamanic traditions, which harness the power of trance to heal and enlighten. And then when large empires formed, we got huge, large-scale religious systems in Mesopotamia and pre-Vedic Indus Valley. Um, and then gradually, we see the emergence of what is sometimes called the axial religions. And those are Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Christianity, and Islam. But however, on a large scale, more than ever before since the emergence of the Axial Age, um, people are beginning to really rethink and remake their spiritual and religious identities. So for many groups across the globe, the Axial Age religions are kind of losing their grip. Um, the stories and practices seem to be less and less compelling among many people. However, I do not think that humanity is losing their religion or spirituality, but it is transforming. And the question is, what is it transforming into? What do our modern technologies and, spirit and scientific insights mean for the future of religion? Are we embarking on some new ways of attaining awakening and enlightenment? New traditions for conceptualizing what it means to be human and relate to the divine? Or will the current religions or the axial age traditions incorporate, absorb, learn from, or adapt to these scientific and technological advancements. So imagine, will Zen centers and Buddhist meditation retreats provide neurofeedback headsets to members so that they can reach deeper states of consciousness more efficiently, skipping years of meditation practice to just jump into nirvana? Or will we see brain stimulation headsets in the pews of Christian churches, right next to the hymnals and prayer cards, perhaps a new stim brain stimulation ritual to prepare one's mind to receive the Holy Spirit? Will Hindu swamis embrace virtual reality programs as a way to experience the wisdom of the Vedas and the Upanishads? I know already of at least one Christian church that exists entirely in VR, in virtual reality. So they perform worship services, baptisms, even the Eucharist in VR. Um, so what do you think the spiritual and religious communities will look like in the future? Are new spiritual technologies compatible with the religious institutions that have so far acted as the gatekeepers for enlightenment in the past 2,500 years? Perhaps those religions will dismiss these technologies as somehow inauthentic. And then the new wave of technology spirituality will deem the old religions obsolete. Or will they work together to create, oh, will they work together or will we see something completely new? So my question has to do with, uh, will t spiritual tech play, what role will it play in the future of religion, religious, traditional religious institutions? Thank you, Kate. And thank you to all of our, um, that's a clapping time. Thank you to all of our panelists for faith. This is, so this is phase one. So now things are about to get more personal. Don't run away. It's not gonna, it's gonna be fun. Um, so what's gonna happen next is we're gonna break up into groups of three. Just anyone around you, you're just gonna kind of form an impromptu group. If it's four people, it's totally fine. If it's two people, it's fine. But we're sort of shooting for groups of three. And as that group of three, can we get the questions up? I guess I have a clicker, don't I? Um, magic. Um, you are gonna choose one of these questions. So that's phase one as a group. It's gonna be like a bonding experience. You're gonna debate, you're gonna decide which question do you want. 
and then you're going to have 10 minutes to explore that question together. You're all going to get pens and note cards. And the goal is to condense after 10 minutes something onto that note card. It could be a question. It could be an answer. It could be a criticism. Any kind of response that you have to that question. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so find your groups, and then we're going to be passing out note cards and pens starting right now. So ready or not, it's okay. No one's getting graded at the end, I promise. Yeah, I know. You got an A+. Plus, but nobody else is getting graded. <laughs> okay. So let's, um, let's bring it in. It's okay if you're still writing or condensing your thoughts. If you don't have a note card finished, that's okay. Try our best. Out of curiosity, this is just because just we're, we're perfecting this format. How many groups were able to write something on a note card? <laughs> that's okay, that's, that's good. That's pretty good, actually. I'm, I'm impressed. Okay. So the, the last phase, we have about uh, 30 minutes for the last phase here. And this is where um, we'll go popcorn style. And any group that wants to can either read what's on their note card, or if you didn't get a chance to, to write something on the note card, it can just be whatever is burning for you, you know, in this, in this topic space around these, around these questions. Who would like to start? Right here in the front. So we were uh, looking at uh, Federico's question, uh, and we uh, are countering it with another question, which is, <laughs> does, it, does it matter if the experience was authentic? Uh, was there a change or a shift that took place? And can this be measured or observed either qualitatively or quantitatively? Yeah, I think, I think that that's a good... And I think we might have one more thing to add. Oh. One of the speculations was, could technology now or in the future have measurable data about specific spiritual mystical experiences, let's say take an enlightenment, right? Of some, or something close to that, so, or the you know, unity and love, unconditional things, yeah. right? So we, uh, again, speculate that it might Again, now in the future, we might be able, with the help of technology, measure specific uh, change in the brain wave activity, in the heart coherence, the you know, patterns of beating, and also even in the um, simple galvanic uh, test of the skin uh, uh, electrical uh, impedance. And the idea is that uh, um, it can be measured because we think that there is a certain calmness, peace, and other qualities of the mystical experience that eventually can be expressed on the level of the, you know, mind, brain activity, heart, the coherence, and the body, which is the galvanic testing. Yeah, those are good, good questions and good observations. I think, I think that certainly, the, for me, the reason why I call it authentic is because it changed me. If I didn't have any change, you know, it was something that was fun for a while, and then, you know, then I was back to where I was before, then I would say that that was not very authentic. So the question of what is authentic or not is a, is a fundamental question, and, you know, I, I certainly, it's not something that you can measure, by the way. I don't think that you have, that, that physics or neuro, science knows how to measure even if we are conscious, frankly. So you can imagine if you, they can measure if you, are, if you have a mystical experience which goes beyond the level of just being conscious. So uh, it may be a long time before there is even some kind of correlation between mental states and what people will call mystical experience. But then to still have to rely to somebody else calling mystical experience what may not be a mystical experience, you see? So unfortunately, we cannot get out of the issue of, of, of essentially the, each one of us has a unique experience. You know, is a subjective, highly subjective experience. So, my my, my 
So, you know, is a, is a question to stimulate, <laughs> to stimulate you to think. <laughs> Just so you guys know, the response is open also to, for anything in the audience, to all of you as well. Do mm. any of you have a response? I could say something too. Um, so, um, in the book that we're writing, we talk a lot about like measurement because one of the ways to develop technologies, right? First, you have to kind of have a way to to measure, to know what you're trying to achieve with the technology, and um, um, and of course, like you know, measuring mystical states is very difficult with things like EEG or um, or the the exact ones that you talked about, heart rate, um, you know, uh, fMRIs, picture, images of the brain, things like that. Um, but if you wanted to Google the hood mysticism scale is, an, is a really old, you know, um, not really old, but it's been around for a while. And so it's, it's basically a survey type instrument that um, people can fill out after an experience. And it has kind of, you know, um, kind of benchmark type, uh, like qualities of the experience that um, determine, determine <laughs> whether or not it, qualifies as a mystical experience. And some of the time, um, sometimes in psychedelic studies, they'll use that measurement and then also others like it to decide whether or not something has, is mystical. So it's just, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's interesting that people are really trying to do that, I think. Yeah. But it's still a self-assessment. Yes, it is, yeah. It is a self-assessment. Uh -huh. yeah. But like the things that make it mystical are like dissolution of the self. You know, yeah. did, you, did you lose your sense of ego? Versus sometimes you have a psychedelic experience that you're still in your body, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, there are quite a few tools out there that uh, measure development and even mystical, I don't typically use the word mystical, but um, stages of awakening that we can actually measure through subjective feedback on their experience. And we are seeing patterns of, of the ways in which people go through that path. And so, although we don't have the brain measurements or the heart rate stuff to necessarily go along with that yet, that is, you know, that, that is things that, are, that, those are things that we're working on right now. Um, but we do have subjective tests that can be taken and we can actually see where people are in their stage of consciousness um, and in other areas of their being. Thank you all. This is, this is a juicy topic. Let's, let's try to get to... Uh... I... So I, I have, uh, yes. I'm going to share a group, but I, to comment to that, there are some amazing brain imaging techniques and studies, and I collect all those, and I know people doing them, mm. that are now correlating the subjective experience with brain physiology. This was started by Andrew Newberg like mm -hmm. 20 years ago mm -hmm. with, with SPECT, but it's, it's been continuing and it's, it's getting refined. Psychedelic brain science has made some amazing inroads. You can actually see in a scan a person's default mode network get reconfigured or get dialed down. And then you can ask them what happened and they'll describe exactly a narrative that is like, I lost my ego, I was, this happened, I had a unitive experience, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and you can see these changes. I do biofeedback, so I'm familiar with heart and skin and all that. Okay, we had a wonderful group. We combined the third and the fourth questions together, which was kind of a really cool idea. So we all were in agreement about everything that we said. And I'll just tackle these as I can remember them. The qualities that were good to enhance about spiritual technologies would lead to humans with more love, compassion, you know, all the things that we always say, right? That, that we can actually tolerate all living together because we're getting very crowded now. And we have to change our consciousness to, to make it work. Uh, we didn't tackle the obsolete one. And then we jumped to um, traditional religious institutions and all that. And I went kind of in a sideways track because I've learned this recently, all of the Mesoamerican religions, and I'm talking about the people that inhabit Mexico, Central America, they're all based on the consumption of entheogens, psychedelic substances, peyote, um, you know, brugmansia, the mushrooms, are done, and, and these religions go back 5,000 years, some of them. They're finding all this is all over the tombs, it's all over the iconography. There's now the archaeologists, first they were resisting this, 
and now the evidence is so overwhelming. They're, I went to a conference where they were all saying, yeah, they're all basically based on consumption of these substances, having these mystical experiences, and then it went, you know, from shamans, priests, kings, and eventually filtered down to elite levels of society, and in some societies it got all the way down to the, to the bottom. So, um, anyway, it was a very good discussion. Thank you for those questions. And mm. Federico, I want to pick your brains about what you experienced and more things, maybe when, later. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dr. Juan. Any, any comments on that? Um, I, we, you talked about the um, Mesoamerican traditions, and um, in the book we have um, actually like a whole chapter on ayahuasca and peyote and things like that. But ayahuasca was one of the most fascinating ones to, um, to study because, of course, it's, it, it still exists. It's, it's huge, right? In shamanic traditions, you can go on retreats down to Peru and, and meet up with a shaman and experience, right? Um, but there's also a really interesting hybrid tradition with Catholicism and ayahuasca. So in the Santa, Santo Daime tradition, ayahuasca is the sacrament. And so it's, it's a really interesting um, example of, uh, you know, what I've called the axial age religion of Christianity, specifically Catholicism, mixing and, and kind of with a syncretic um, action between these two traditions and coming out with this with this new religion, basically, that, um, that incorporates both. So, so it's interesting to think that could, if that happened with ayahuasca, could that also happen with some of these technologies, or could they you know, mix? That would be a great science fiction movie. Um, <laughs> yes. OK, we uh, use the second one, Carol. This is how do we move from tech-induced temporary state changes towards stage shifts, like full-blown stage shifts? And what we came up with was that whatever happens in whatever technology it is needs to be so strong that it affects the heart in, in a loving sense mm -hmm. in a very such a strong way that we make a conscious decision from that moment on to, to come back to that state on our own, like we're going to stay here no matter what. And um, that it feels good enough to stay there that we, because of the, the, the event was so strong or events and that we always look out for the triggers and the programming that kind of want to get us sucked back in there and we, 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 we um, remain vigilant to the, to the work. So I think that's what we came up with. Yeah, is that it? And even that? Yeah, so that's, that's what we came up with there. Thanks. Any comments on that? No. The, the, the question that comes up for me that I'm curious always to get people's sense of is, um, is there anything about modern technology, not in its current state, kind of squinting your eyes and kind of looking into the future a little, um, that um, inherently prevents it from being a tool to support what you're talking about, these kinds of deeper mystical or spiritual experiences? Or is it just a design problem? Yeah. Oh, I'd say, I mean, the big challenge is around our scientific understanding of what these experiences slash states slash traits you know are and how to how to model them um you, you know you mike you taught me that technology arises out of the application of science you reminded me of that it's applied science so you know there's a lot happening in the psychedelic sciences and the contemplative sciences but there's still also really new and relatively small branches of human <coughs> science so like we barely know anything. Um, and so to me, the technologies that are coming out now, even though they're like exciting, you know, future technologies will be based on future science. And, you know, this field is just in a way starting. So, so I'll, I'll throw another question out to the panel and also, you know, if anyone is interested, Federico, I'm kind of looking at you. Um, <laughs> so then, um, of course, right now, in the scheme of things, science is, is relatively limited. We really don't really understand how the brain works. We don't understand consciousness. We don't understand, um, you know, we have kind of a vague sense of what mystical experience looks like in the brain. Um, how far can this go? What are the, the real limits? Like thinking 100 years in the future, however far in the future, what are the real limits 
to science's ability to understand mystical experience, and in that, according to what Vince said, be able to engineer tools from that understanding. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah about 20 years ago, maybe more, I was thinking if I could create a virtual reality game that would allow to safely experience that if you do harm to others, you end up doing harm to yourself as an experience, not, not as a thought or as an intellectual knowing, okay? Um, and, you know, it was not a, you know, I didn't start a company on doing that. I simply, I simply was, you know, in my spare time thinking about it and thinking that that would be a place for technology to actually create a safe environment to experience, for example, how violence can actually end up being self-violence. You know, and this kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, that's so far out, actually, in order to do that safely. And also, the question is, who wants to do that? Okay? So, in other words, is, is society then ask, forcing people that are violent to have to go through this retraining on, on this virtual reality game? Or are people that are violent have the consciousness to say, I don't want to be violent, I want to understand and choose to go do this stuff, right? I think actually today what I think is the education of the children is fundamental to teach them, give them an emotional education. I think that we teach our, our children intellectual things, you know, you know, learning things, repeating things or con con concepts but they don't develop their heart. And, and there is no, you know, there I think is a place for technology to actually help and help effectively give children the sense of what I'm talking about through games, through forms of interaction. I mean, I don't know, but this may be five, 10 years away or 20 years away instead of 100 years away, like the first one. Well, I hope to see that for my future children. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so back to the audience, great. Hi, I want to make a quick comment on the question you just asked. Um, the first sin we came to, and I'm going to quote my wife, who's one of the non-dual speakers here. We were sitting listening to the scientists talking uh, about, you know, where's the bridge between science and non-duality? And she whispered in my ear, until there's a scientist doing this research who is actually awake, they're not going to have the lens of perception to be able to get past the observer effect. So the lens of perception of the observer has to be an enlightened state before they'll be able to get this information. So just wanted to say that. And our group took on uh, Carol's question as, as well. Um, how do we move from tech-induced temporary states towards stage shifts? And we came up with three things. The first was there has to be a baseline reality of wholeness and worthiness in the person as a prerequisite to doing this work. So they have to have their conditioning cleaned up before they attempt to go into these higher states through technology. That's what's going to make it stick for them and not just a glimpse. Uh, the second is making use, of, making use of the insights, and the other group alluded to this, by altering their behavior and their habits and taking action on the information that they receive from the session. Uh, and this is also called integration. So if it doesn't make them change their habits and it's just like, oh, wow, that was cool, and they don't do anything with it, then it's just going to be temporary. And uh, the third thing we came up with was that you also need to create a community around this because it's the community aspect of some of the traditional things that support maybe even as a reminder to put these insights into action. Mm -hmm. And if we're just sitting in our house with our device and there's no one around us, you don't get that same resonance that would help hold the stage shift instead mm -hmm. of just the state. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, just in comment back to your first comment around um, the stage of consciousness that is creating the technology is what definitely what we're putting out there. So I get really interested in um, what stage of consciousness are we operating from as techies in creating what we're creating and what we're putting out in the world is a reflection of that. Um, 
Carol's also doing coaching in some of the major tech companies out there, yeah. I should say. Um, I'm curious too, based on your feedback on um, wholeness and um, all of that, I'm curious, what would that tech look like? Would it be VR? Would it be AR? Would it be AI? You know, to, to create that space that you're talking about, which I love your three descriptions, beautifully said. But what, what would that look like? What would that tech be doing with that individual or that collective? Um, yeah, so I kind of put the question back to you. Love how your description of it and how you framed it, those important qualities in that. And then what, what would it actually look like as we manifest that in the world? Hi, uh, I also wanted to uh, ask a question for that. So um, uh, we came up with, or we talked about, when it's instead of temporary being permanent, that it leads to a measurable um, calming of the autonomic nervous system or of a conscious self-regulation process to be able to de-stress. And then to, to make it more permanent also in terms of the technology, um, personalizing technology. And as Mikey said, like what is, may, maybe it's not a design problem, maybe it's a problem that it's so mind-driven and making it more embodied and integrating biodata, which obviously has like like a very dangerous side too, but if it's be personalized based on machine learning that it uses that, like what is the heart rate, which is a holistic, or like the breathing pattern, which is a holistic thing, and how could the design be personalized to help the person breathe deeper or have a calmer heart rate on a um, consistent basis instead of a temporary basis? Yeah. Thank you. Any uh, comments on that? I am. Um, I, I think that technology's capacity to be personalized and to be dynamic and to adjust to the unique needs of a person is one of the really special things about it that makes it um, useful for this kind of endeavor. Yeah. Um, awesome. Anyone else have a? Yeah. One more. Um, so we went with question one, how can we know that a technology and just mystical experience is authentic? And we say here, input is irrelevant if output is the same, so long as it is transformative and loving. Can you say that again? Input is irrelevant if output is the same, so long as it is transformative and loving. And when I was thinking about authenticity, I was kind of imagining a spectrum whereby the contemplative purist sits at the most authentic part of that spectrum, using, say, pure breath as a way to induce mystical experience. And then if we step forward on that spectrum or backwards into less authenticity, we maybe get to plant purists, so entheogen-induced mystical experience. And from the contemplative purist perspective, these entheogens users aren't as authentic as them. And yet we go further along the spectrum, and we get tech in just mystical experience, which is less authentic to the entheogen and the plant enthusiast and the contemplative purist, and yet still on that spectrum of authenticity. And so everything is an intervention. Breath is an intervention. As asana is intervention. Lucid dreams are interventions. What is authentic given it's all a spectrum? Thank you. I love that. <laughs> I, I, the vision just crossed my mind of, of um, the, the, uh, the, the contemplative technologists, the, the techno meditators who say, all of that old traditional stuff is not authentic because you can't measure it, right? Or the, you know, the, the entheogenic approaches are not authentic because you can't, you know, you can imagine a whole new kind of purist that would say, actually only the technology induced enlightenment is the legitimate one because it can be validated. So it's interesting, you can imagine all of the, everyone thinks that their way is the only true right way. It's interesting. Um, any, uh, any comments? I agree. I think, I think that's, that's a good way to look at it. Um, for me, for example, I'm scared of drugs, so I don't take drugs, but I have, every time I go to a holotropic breath, breath work, it's not the Stan Groff, but it's a variation of that. I have an extraordinary experience of consciousness. So 
you know, I don't have to take any drugs and I don't have any consequence of, you know, because ayahuasca, I understand, is a kind of a rough kind of thing, kind of a rough, rough trip, but if it's fine with a person to take ayahuasca to have a rough trip and have some insights that actually are transformative, I'm all for that. So I'm not, I'm not judging, you know, you should not take drugs or not. For me, it, it, I, don't, I don't want to take them, but, and I found other ways to, to continue to have new transformative experiences that are revealing aspects of me that I didn't know. Because to me, what, what is important is actually to know myself, to understand what moves me, my real intentions, the intentions of my spirit, as opposed to the intention of my body, and uh, figure it out and understand it and move on. So there you go. I would like to add that uh that answering your question as to how I personally know it is authentic, whether it was plant-induced or technology-induced or whatever, is and whether it's long-lasting or not, because I don't know what's going to happen the next minute, and there's an integration process yes. that could last, you know, one day to several years. So the only way that I know it is authentic is when I sense on a physiological level a shift where my ego is not directing. Yeah. Where I'm just, I just know, because it's not my usual way of producing, understanding, acting. It's something else that I'm not familiar with, and yet I know it is real. Yeah. And in fact, it feels more real than anything else I've done before. Yeah. Two. Okay. So I think that that's the end of our questions. Um, I'm uh, really grateful for all of you for participating. This is uh, one of our first few experiments with the Unpanel. I'd love to get your feedback both on the topic but also on the structure itself. So if you, if you liked doing the questions, you didn't like it, come talk to me. I'm trying to make this as a new way of doing panels. Um, and, and I kind of want to, because I have the microphone and I get to be a microphone hog, I want to leave with one thought, which is just um, what, world, what would the world be like if we don't design technology to be in support of awakening? Mm -hmm.